to all of you and a warm welcome to today's uh, book release of Nan Umbrecher's Beyond the Silence. Uh, I'd like to tell everybody this is a very special occasion, especially for me, because I read her book, I think, I don't, know, I don't even remember when I read her book, it must have been about 10 years ago, and it just captivated me, it absolutely, I don't know, it just changed my life. And ever since then, I've been wanting to get in touch with her. And, uh, well, just last year, some things, like coincidences happened, and things fell into place, and I got in touch with her. And, well, she's here now. And it's absolutely a very fortunate incident. Uh, let me uh, introduce Nan to you. At one time, Nan Umbrinder had absolutely no inclination towards spirituality. But all that changed with the untimely death of her son, Carl, a champion jockey. During a long period of grieving, Nan, as fate would have it, met some people who communicated with their loved ones in the spirit world. Soon she also started communicating with her lost son and began to receive messages from him that would alter the course of her life forever. Initially, while she felt exhilarated, she could not help but question this phenomenon. Was she fantasizing, imagining, think, or just indulging in wishful thinking? Was there really a higher energy force, angels, guides, guardians, and a god? As Nan delved deeper, building a bridge across two worlds, she decided to share her experience with others. This led to writing a book in which she detailed how Carl showed her the way out of grief towards happiness, and how she came to believe in Meher Baba, her son's spiritual master. With her insights and her immovable faith, Nan has helped many people deal with the loss of their loved ones. With Baba's help, she says, many hearts have been healed, and many lives have undergone a change for the better. In Beyond the Silence, which is her latest book, Nan sheds more light on the spiritual master Meher Baba's ever readiness to reach out in silence <coughs> to each and every person who calls out to him from the depths of their hearts. It draws one closer to the understanding of the real goal of human life by laying emphasis on the thread of love, which not only seems the physical and the spirit worlds, but also brings all of us together as one big family into the new humanity. Beyond the Silence is a chronicle of Nan's generous willingness to help people who have been struck by tragedy and grief. She has done this by enabling them to build a bridge across the two worlds through the loving and caring messages of her son Carl, who dwells in the spiritual world, realms. Nan has thus been a shining beacon to thousands of people who have, with the Master's grace and the caring intervention of Carl, found their own answers and way out of sorrow and pain. Beyond the Silence is a continuing account of people from all walks of life who are entering into this ever-growing, loving fold. She is also the author of the best-selling book, Sounds of Silence, and a sequel, Listening to the Silence. I will now ask Nan to elaborate more on this. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I will start by telling you a little bit about Carl. Carl was born in 1960. He was a premature child. He was born seven months and struggled and struggled and struggled to survive. He was in the hospital for 17 days, came home from there, and even after that, it took a long time for us to get him on his feet. As he grew, he became stronger, and of course, his, his passion for riding and horses became very apparent. He was so obsessed with the horses that he used to go to the race course and he used to sit outside and he used to watch because my husband and I were very fond of horses. We always used to go to the races. So as my family also came, he but he was the most, the most, most impressed with everything and wanted to learn how to ride. So we taught him how to ride. He started riding in gymkhana races. He started winning in the gymkhana races and that activated him still further. When he passed through school, which was, he passed his 11th and 12th, 
he wanted to he didn't want to go to college he wanted to take a license to write of course we were against it because at that time uh, we were not sure like how he would get on with it but he was so he was so keen on it that we said okay let's give him a chance and so we got him a uh, writing voice license he started writing in 1977 that's that he was 17 years old soon he got uh, he, by 1977 he had already got <coughs> taken up by the Gopal Dasas in, in their stable and he started uh, he wrote his first winner he, of course he was over the moon and he was so so happy over the whole thing after that 1978 was a beautiful year for Carl he won literally everything on the race course he won the 2000 guineas he won the derby he won the oaks and then he was fighting for the championship and this was 1979 he was fighting for the championship and this was the last day of the Bombay races when he was in a three horse field and one of the horses crossed him and he fell. <coughs> the horse stepped on his uh, lungs and we had to take him to the hospital. Uh, there he struggled for 18 days. <coughs> for 18 days and then uh, eventually after 18 days he passed away. Of course it was the saddest thing for everybody. The whole race was came was grieving for him. The family was grieving for him. And so, you know, we lived opposite the race course. And from my window, I could actually every day see the place where Carl fell. So every day our windows were closed, curtains were drawn, and we literally lived like that for the next four or five years. Till one day, my husband read an article in the newspaper and it said, uh, they talk to their dead sons. That was the heading of the article. And he said, look, see, read this, see what this lady is saying. So I, I read it. It was a Mrs. Bhav, about a Mrs. Bhavna B who spoke to her sons through something called auto writing. Now everything was very new to me and I didn't really think anything of it. I said, no, but please, if somebody can write to your dead people, then everybody, one, one, you can't everybody write, so I put it away. And then I felt drawn to it, I felt drawn to it, I picked it up, I read it. I read it and then of course I felt drawn to going to Mrs. Bhavnagri. So soon I found my way to her house. I met her, she explained the whole thing to me. And she said, uh, do you want a message from Carl? So I said, yes. So she sat down and wrote, and the message said, oh, dear mommy, I'm very happy to talk to you. Why don't you also take up the pen and learn how to write? She said, try, try. You'll be able to do it. But of course, you know, I was, I was so ignorant. And I said, no, I don't think I'll be able to do it. And I just left it. I came home. As, as usual, I was drawn to it, I was drawn to it. So I took up a book the next morning and I started to do what she asked me to do. And the pen moved, it moved up and down the page and I began to write. I began to write scribbles, scrawls, lines, nothing legible, nothing legible at all. And, and, and then slowly, slowly, the, the word uh, mom started coming. Mom came, then wherever came, wherever, and then home came. So all this came in separate places. And then one day, all the three words joined together, and wherever mom, home, was a sentence that Carl wrote. Now, just before he passed away in the hospital, he used to hold my hand and say, Mom, I want to go home. I want to go home. And so I knew that, okay, nobody could have known this, this was really Carl writing. So I was thrilled, I was thrilled. And then after a little while, the word Meher started coming. 
मतलब मेहर 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 लाइन्स एंड लाइन्स ऑफ मेहर Maybe it's an aunt of mine or a cousin of mine. But so again, I went back to Mrs. Bhavnagri, and I said. So she said, "No, I can't give you the answer." There's a lady called Mrs. Rishi who does the Vijaya book. Now you go to her and you ask her. So I found my Mrs. Rishi. I climbed some rickety, and she did the Vijaya board. And I've never seen a Vijaya board in my life before. I never knew what a Vijaya board was. But I sat down with her, and she started to uh, do the Ouija board, and the name Carl came. And she didn't know Carl's name, so of course for me it was a, a, a great thing. And then she, and I said, Carl, what happened? So he wrote, I fell down. And I said, and then what happened? He said, I got brain hemorrhage. Now hemorrhage is a long uh, word for a lady, a you know, Maharashtra lady. I was about 80 or 85 years old to write. So for me, it was really an eye opener, and I, because that was what happened. Eventually, Carl did get a brain hemorrhage, and he passed away after that. So, and so I said, then who is Mayor Baba? So he said, no. I said, who is Mayor? Who is Mayor? Who is what's this Mayor that you want? So he wrote Mayor Baba. So I said, who is Mayor Baba? He said, he is my guru. So I said, what is a guru? I, I mean, I was so ignorant. I really didn't even know what it was. <coughs> so then, I, um, so I said, "What do you want me to do?" So he said, "Go wherever he is. Go wherever he is. Go wherever he is." So I eventually came home and I started to find out where was Mehr Baba. I found out that Mehr Baba had an ashram in Ahmednagar. So I wrote a letter and I said. Uh, Please, if this letter reaches you, I want to have an appointment with Mayor Baba. And if if, if if this letter reaches you, please tell me how I can come. I had no address, so I just wrote Mayor Baba Ahmad Nagar, and I sent the envelope, and it reached. It reached, and I got a reply back to say Mayor Baba's ashram is in Ahmad Nagar, and if you uh, come there, we will you can meet too. Mayor Baba is not in physical body anymore. But you can go to his samadhi. Samadhi was a new name for me. I really didn't know what was a samadhi, what was an ashram, nothing. But slowly, slowly, one day, I happened to. I had an ally in my family. Her name is Savita. She is my daughter-in-law, and everybody else was against. But she was the only one who really encouraged me. And one day, Neville was going to Pune. So she begged of him to please take mummy to Ahmednagar. So that was the first time I went to Ahmednagar with Neville. We reached Ahmednagar, and there was a small little ashram called was called Mehrabad, and we went there and we got out and we met a lady called Dolly. She showed us around. And she said, "How did you come?" So of course, to tell her the strange story was not easy, and she took us up to the samadhi. Message, Mehr Baba, go to Ahmednagar. Go, go, Baba. Message, message, Mehr Baba. So I, so while Dolly was showing us around, she took us to uh, Baba's room, and there there was a chair, and on top of the chair was written a message: "Don't worry, be happy." And Dolly said, "This is Mehr Baba's message to the world." So I said, "This is his message to the world. Don't worry, be happy." Said, yeah, that's it. So that was not very difficult for me because I didn't want to believe in any god or I didn't want to believe in any any guru or I didn't I was not in the mood for it. But if it says don't worry, be happy, we said okay, that's fine. So anyway, we went up to the samadhi and what I said, what do I do here? She said, you you bow down and you just tell Baba that you called me and I've come. So I did just that. It was very peaceful, very beautiful, and. Neville and I came home. We came home, and of course, Jimmy said, "My husband Jimmy said, uh, what happened?" So we told him the whole story, but he didn't believe it. He didn't want to believe it. That night, when I went to sleep, I suddenly found uh, my hand trembling. I took up 
the, 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 the writing book was next to my bed, so I took it up and I started writing and it wrote, Mehr Baba is very happy, Mehr Baba is very happy, Mehr Baba is very happy. And the whole page was filled with Mehr Baba was very happy. So that's how my writing began. And after that, the words started, a few more words started coming and said, I am with Mehr Baba, I am Mehr Baba's right hand man. I please come back to Medabad, bring daddy, bring daddy, bring daddy. Now how to bring daddy? So one day suddenly I think I think Baba must have seen him because he came and he peeped into my book and after that I found him coming and sitting next to me and looking into my book. And Carl kept saying, Dad, please come to Medabad, I am there, please come, please come. So one day he said, Okay, Chalo, I'll come with you. And that's it. So we arranged to go to Medapal. Now there was, Carl was so excited over the whole thing. There was a, and he wrote a message to say, and we were ready to go. He said, I am waiting for you, mom. I'm going to be there when you come, and you will see me for sure. I promise you, and you will know it is me. You will see me clearly, for I will show myself to you, mom. I will be near you. I am a man, a person, who is living there by the name of Hama. Yes, that is right. That is my name. I am not an Indian. I am a foreigner. And I am living there just now. I am going to meet you there and say hello to you. Mom, you must not make a scene or cry out. I will come near you and sit down. You want proof of Mayor Baba? I am going to give it to you. I am fair and good looking. I will be wearing a red shirt, brown pants, and no shoes on my feet. I am a foreigner between the age of 18 and 25, and my name is Hannah McLean. I am Baba's right hand man. To say I was taken aback is putting it mildly. I read and reread the message and searched every area of my mind for a rational explanation, but failed to get one. I could not keep this from my family, but if I was scared and nervous at the time of first sharing, this time I was terrified of their reactions, especially Jimmy's. With fingers crossed, I read Carl's message out to them. As expected, Jimmy threw a major tantrum. Enough, he shouted. You've taken leave of your senses. This is crazy and I am not coming. In the midst of this verbal attack, I heard Nehru begin to laugh. This is so like Carl, he said. He just has to do something sensational. Having thus diffused the situation, Neville continued to talk to his father till he calmed down. And finally, Jimmy grudgingly agreed to take one step at a time, and we resumed our course to Merima. The flight to Pune was delayed, and the journey seemed endless. As the car sped along the dusty road from Pune to Amarnagar, I had enough time to wonder whether I had gone off the deep end. Would there be really someone waiting for me there? Would Carl really show himself? It was hard to believe. My confidence and trust had been awakened by Mayor Baba's previous message, don't worry, be happy. But this new message was just too much. I was tense as I watched the stern expression of my companion who sat looking straight before me. The center was deserted. It's this, it, it was quiet. Its deserted appearance was due to the fact that all the devotees had left for Merza at Baba's home. Not wasting a moment, I began, look, began looking around for a glimpse of the red shirt, but the only person inside was After a while, feeling a little disappointed I, that there was nobody around waiting for us, I looked at Jimmy and Neville wondering what their thoughts were. But both were so engrossed in the new world which had somehow opened up for them. It was in it. I heard Dolly say, Chalo, come on, let us go to the Samadhi, and she led the way to the car. It was in a presently <coughs> hot summer's day. The sky was a warm blue, not dotted with white, fleecy clouds. The only sound to be heard was the dull drone of flies, not a leaf stirred. And then suddenly it happened. A figure stepped out of the samadhi. My eyes first fell on bare feet, then traveled upwards slowly to discover the color of brown pants. I continued my gaze upwards till finally 
The blood red of the shirt struck me like a thunderbolt between the clouds and shut my eyes, unable to believe what I had just seen. My body and mind shook uncontrollably, and when I tried to regain some semblance of normality, I found that Neville had clutched my arm in a wild grip. Jimmy's face had turned pale. I heard the concern in Dolly's voice, but not her words, as we stood rooted to the spot. I felt a touch as she urged me forward and looked straight into the piercing blue eyes of a young foreigner, fair, good-looking, and tall. The next thing I knew, I was leaning in Baba's tomb, with tears streaming down my face. Stifling, stifling huge sobs, I placed my head at Baba's feet. No words can describe how I felt, and there was nothing coherent in my thoughts. When I came out of the Samadhi, he was still there. His hand outstretched as he gave me two little orange sweets, the prasad, as always the custom after visiting Baba's too. After that, he put his arms around me and said softly, Jai Baba. The world stood still. Having taken Baba's darshan, we sat together, each of us deep in thought, and he sat with us as if he did belonged. His beautiful eyes were closed, and he remained motionless as if his thoughts were far away with his master. Leaving him like that, it was very difficult to move on, but we had to go, because we had to visit Merazar, which is Baba's home. <coughs> We went to Merazad and there we shared this story with the Baba Mandi. And, sorry, leaving him reluctantly and only because we had no choice, we walked to Mansari. Now, Mansari is Baba's disciple who lives next door to Baba, next door to the Samadhi. So, we walked to Mansari's home to introduce Jimmy to this unusual lady. And then there was a lady sitting there. And she got up and she said, oh, hello, Mrs. Omega, how are you? I've been waiting to meet you. I've been wanting to meet you. I've heard your story from Merabar friends and I'm so deeply touched by it. Puzzled with the familiar manner in which she talked to us, I wondered who this over-friendly American could be. She continued to share a little about herself when we learned of her own tragedy, the death of her young husband in a car accident. She explained that this was to be her last day in Merabar before she returned to America. We sat and shared a cup of tea with Mansari and this lady got up and she put her hands around me and she said, I found so much peace here, my dear. I just know you will find it here. We walked out of Mansari's little home and saw the boy in the red shirt leave the samadhi and walk towards us. I pushed Neville. I said, Neville, go ask him, go ask him, go ask him his name. Neville went to ask him his name. His name was Patrick. Slightly disappointed that the name was not McLean, what I expected, we walked to the car and we drove, drove away to Merazad. The last thing we saw him was Patrick standing up on the hill and waving to us in a red shirt and a brown van, and we drove off to Merazad. In Merza, we shared the story with the family. Some of them were sad, some of them were touched by the story. But we had to, soon we had to leave, we had a, a flight to catch. But there was one more thing to do. Jimmy and Neville were on the way to the car when I approached Heather, the lady in charge of the pilgrim center, and said, Ma'am, can you please tell me if there's a McLean entered in your book? She looked at her register and she said, we don't have a Mr. McLean, but we did have a Mrs. McLean. I'm afraid you missed her because she was leaving this morning. So on the way back from the car, we were thinking maybe that the, uh, the over-friendly lady in Mansari's house must have been, may have been this lady. So I couldn't wait. I got home. I rushed to the telephone and I quickly dialed the number of Dolly and I said, Dolly, please tell me who was the lady who was sitting in Mansari's room. I poised pen over paper and waited with patient press. Over the crackle of the receiver, I, I heard her reply. Her name is Mrs. McLean. Actually, no, she has two names. She
she calls herself Mrs. McLean Carl's son. Five pairs of eyes were glued to the paper as I wrote the name down. As I came to the last word, Carl's son, my fingers began to shake and the room spun around and the receiver fell from my hands. We collapsed on the sofa, too stunned to speak. I recalled Carl's words, come to Meribad and you will see the difference in your life. For when you go home, things will have changed and happiness will always be there for you. This chapter would not be complete if I did not mention that two years later, Mrs. McLean came back to Meribad in her quest to adopt a baby. She wanted to meet me, so I went to meet her. And I was telling her about that incredible day in Meribad and the boy and the samadhi, and she stopped me and she said, why didn't you ask his name? I said, we did, his name was Patrick. There was pin drop silence. Her face registered shock. Then her mind seemed to raise furiously, so something slowly dawned on her. Oh my God, she said, my husband's name was Patrick. Patrick? Carlson McLean. I find the connection simply amazing. And furthermore, I have to point out, I too had dressed him in his favorite dress shirt before he was put to rest. That was my day in Meribad. After that, I'm sure you must understand that seeing Carl in spirit form there made my whole life different. My whole life changed. We went back home and we really started feeling, having a kind of feeling for Merabar and for Mer Baba and really believing in what we had seen and what we had heard. Life went on after that and I started to do the communication more and more and more. But actually I am not the only one who has seen Carl in spirit form. There are many, many stories that followed and many, many people who have seen Carl in spirit form, I'll ask Priya to read out one or two stories for you, of which people, other people have seen Carl in spirit form. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Priya and I'll be reading out a few uh, stories about Carl and how uh, Carl has helped a lot of people come to terms with their loss or just bring a little more happiness and peace into their lives. But before I do that, I'd just like to take one little moment to say thank you to Nan, who has brought Carl and Baba into my life. So here goes. Una, 1997. The phone rang. Excuse me, Mrs. Omrigard. Do you do not know me. Thank you. I'll do that again. Una, 1997. The phone rang. Excuse me, Mrs. Umbrikar, you do not know me, but such a strange thing happened that I had to call you to tell you, tell you about it. She continued, I have a daughter about five years old who seems to be quite psychic. She sees imaginary friends, talks to them, plays with them, and is so totally happy with them that she never seems to miss real people or children of her own age. I really worry for her, for she arranges imaginary tea parties and holds long conversations with imaginary children, when actually there is no one there at all. I keep asking her what she is doing and whom she is talking to, but she just smiles blissfully and says, I'm playing with my friends. One day, as she happily skipped and ran about in the garden, I joined her and began to pester her to at least tell me the name of one of her playmates. For the first time, Dilnavaz suddenly stopped her game, cocked her head on one side, looked straight at me, and gave a direct answer. His name is Carl, she said, and I had to be content with that. A few days later, I was reading a book given to me by a friend and at the same time keeping a watchful eye on my daughter who was playing in the garden. The doorbell rang. I put the book down on the table and went to answer the call. When I returned, Dilnavaz had come in and was staring at the cover of the book. Her cheeks were pink with excitement. 
Her eyes sparkled like jewels, and there was a look of such indescribable joy on her face that I was stunned. What is it, Dhanavas? What is it? I asked. My friend, my friend, she screamed in delight. This is my friend, Mommy. Mrs. Omrigard, I just wanted to tell you that the book I was reading was Sounds of Silence, and the face on the cover was the face of your son, Carl. Another beautiful story. 1998. A soft and gentle voice told me over the phone that she was dimpled from Bombay. Her husband had recently passed away. She was left to shoulder the responsibility of looking after not just her children and old parents, but also the family business. She heard about Sounds of Silence, bought it, read it, and came to ask if it was possible to get a message through to her husband. Soon a link was established, and with the grace of Baba and the efforts of Carl, Dimple was comforted and happy with what she received for a while. She even went on to learn to do auto writing on her own. There were times of depression when the writing was weak and also times of elation when something, she, something he said would suddenly click and she would be able to feel his presence clearly. He would also talk incessantly of Baba and it was more because of this that Dimple learned to love Baba and greatly depend upon him. As her sensitivity increased, she began to have a strong feeling that her husband Ramesh and Carl had become friends and were closely linked with one another. Was there any way to be sure? It is quite normal in this kind of situation that there comes a time when we tend to doubt our own capabilities and feel that the writing is not really from the spirit world, but just a product of our own subconscious mind. This also happened to Dimple, and she began to wonder if it was really Ramesh or just plain Dimple with her relatives in a small remote village. Someone there told her of a bai who claimed to have a sixth sense and was a good clairvoyant. Dimple could not resist the temptation and went to visit this lady. She was welcomed and made to sit and meditate on her husband while the bai made necessary preparations. In a few moments, Dimple's thoughts were interrupted. Through a cloud of smoke and incense, she heard the words. Of the words, Ha, dikta hai, dikta hai. Tumhara pati dikta hai. Yes, I can see him. I can see your husband. And the lady went on to describe him quite perfectly, till suddenly she stopped. She screwed up her eyes as if looking for something more and added, Thay ye, aur bhi koi saath mein hai, aur bhi koi dikta hai, koi chota, patla, jaisa jockey type, jaisa dikta hai, koi aisa dost hai kya? Wait, I can see something more. Someone else is with him. Someone thin and small, like a jockey. Does he have a friend like that? Dimple, Dimple was more than just startled. How could this village ever have known what a jockey looked like? Dimple had got her proof. And here's one more. Uh, Priya Bhatibala's mother stayed in hospital for more than three, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> excuse me. Priya Bhardiwala's mother stayed in hospital for more than three and a half years without much hope of a recovery. She was mostly in an unconscious state, hardly able to open her eyes or really to focus on her daughter's kind and loving face. Maybe she was holding on to life because she felt that her only child would be left alone in this world what should Priya do? Should she take her mother home or let her remain in hospital? Should she let her live out her time this way or put on her on support, life support machine? Carl told Priya to sit by her mother's bedside and constantly help to release her by saying, Mom, I am alright, go in peace and love. All is well, go to Baba. 
He kept stressing on the importance of not holding on and letting go cause of hysterical at the bedside of one who needs to let go of life and move on. Carl explains, coma does not mean that the soul has left the body. It just means that a physical body is comatose and cannot in any way pass the message to the brain. Consequently, the brain cannot react to any of the sensory organs in the body. No recognition in eyes, no movement of the lips, no expression on the face, noise registers, sounds register, voices vibrate, but do not make any sense. So no amount of shouting or saying something loudly will ever help. There is a feeling of neither being here nor there. It is like being in limbo. It is a state from where you either opt to come back again or want to slip away. However, if you just sit quietly and touch the hand and send out a lot of gentle love, it helps the person to know that they are not alone and that someone cares enough to be there. It helps. Coma is a period where God allows the soul to rest and then to make a karmic choice whether to stay or leave. It is the time to decide whether to prolong the days or to limit the days or to finish the days according to his karmic plan. Whichever way it is, this plan has to be completed before the soul leaves the body. Baba makes the soul realize everything the moment it passes on and then carries on with its normal procedure from there. All the earlier Priya kept crying and urging her mother to fight, she soon started doing her best to follow what Carl had told. In the process, she found herself so much more at peace, knowing that her decision to entrust her mother into Baba's care was for the best. And that was all, and that would be well, and all would be well when the time came. The time came eight months later, and on the 17th of September, 2008, Priya's mom peacefully passed away and went to Baba. After all, the last rites were over, Priya and her good friend Steve made their way to Mehrabad to thank Baba for all his help in her time of need. She sat inside the Samadhi and with tears in her eyes offered sincere gratitude to her beloved Divine Master. Could Baba please show her a sign that he had heard her? She got up and sprinkled a handful of her mother's ashes behind the Samadhi with a wish that everyone in the family would always merge with Baba in every way. Then she seated herself with Steve on the bench in front of the tomb to sit in silence for a while. She felt someone give her a nudge. A young girl came and literally pushed her way to sit beside them. Wondering why this little girl wanted to be near them, she closely at her and was very, and she saw that the little girl was wearing a t-shirt with a heart printed in the middle and Carl written in bold letters across it. Priya says, Carl is my beloved friend and guide and has traveled the journey with mom and me these last three years and eight months. Through Carl, Baba had made a promise to my mom while she was well. He promised her that he would always take care of me and that he has and he continues to do so even now. So when the young girl with the word Carl printed on her t-shirt came and sat next to us, it was as though Carl was saying to me, look, Baba is keeping his promise to mom and please know that I am also with you and all who ever need Baba, always and forever. I just want to say that the story is really about me, uh, the fact that, you know, Carl showed himself and has given so many signs, such beautiful, inspiring signs of hope and peace of his being there. And I just want to also add a small little story about the cover of the new book, Beyond the silence. If you see, it's a picture of a beautiful bird in the sky. And this is not something that is a painting or Photoshop or you know anything. It is a real, real sign, a real image of a cloud in the shape of a beautiful, huge white bird. And we and it's a coincidence or a blessing, but we 
saw this, I saw this and we shot this picture right here in Goa on Kamalosan Beach. Because we come here every year for the Goa Fest that happens. I happen to work in advertising. And while we were there, very tensed and worried about, you know, uh, winning awards, which Goa Fest is an award show for advertising fraternity. And uh, I, I asked Carla to be there with me before this award show. And while we were sitting on the beach, uh, just before the awards uh, program began, uh, we, we saw that there was this beautiful, huge, big, white bird, uh, you know, right there in the sky. Carl kept his promise and showed himself to me. He had said in the writing earlier that, you know, he would come as the big white bird on Steve's right shoulder, my partner's right shoulder. And I always thought, I thought maybe it will be like a t-shirt print or a tattoo, there are many tattoos in Goa, or maybe, uh, you know, a sculpture of a bird or something. But this was amazing, and Carl always, always, always surprises me, the way he shows himself, it, it was amazing. And we were lucky that we had our camera phones, uh, you know, our phones with us and the camera in it, so we took pictures, and here it is as proof right here on the cover of this book. So do read the story inside. Now we've read a few stories. Uh, you may want to know what actually is auto writing. So I'm going to ask Nandini to read out a little bit about auto writing for you so that you can get an idea of what it really is. This is what <coughs> Mother Teresa has to say about auto writing in her book. Auto writing came to me as a moment of grace from God to heal my heart and to draw me towards the light. It changed the course of my life. I became that little pencil in the hand of a writing God who was sending a love letter to the world. That was Mother Teresa. So what then is auto writing? When I went to the Arthur Finlay College at, Stan at the Stansted Hall in Essex and spent a week there in order to gain more experience, I learned a great deal more than what I already knew from reading books by well-known authors on the subject in question. In the words of Gideon McCoy, auto writing is the art of contacting others, other intelligences through the use of pen and paper while in an altered or meditative state of consciousness. It is not difficult and most people have some degree of success fairly quickly. It is very necessary for you to follow the ground rules and try to understand the what's and how's surrounding it. Many gifts lie within us and our minds have many marvelous powers, but we do not know how to tap them. By using these gifts the right way, by merging ourselves with the universal mental energy, our superconscious mind can open many doors and gain access to a great deal of information in the end unknown to us. Auto writing then is mostly a fusion when two minds join together and the answers flow from the spirit mind to the human mind. The thought first passes to the brain and then out to the hand. And if you spend a little time and effort, it is really not that difficult or dramatic. However, many a time, especially in the initial stages, words and sentences tend to repeat themselves over and over again, till you wonder if anything else is ever going to come, and then suddenly a new word flashes on the paper and you feel overjoyed. Then most important of all is concentrated practice. When you're auto writing, the best thing to do is to shut off all distractions and noises from the outside world. Sit in a quiet, familiar place, still the mind, and try and place yourself in a medium level state of consciousness. Irene McCoy says, there is never any danger in this because you do not at any time severe your connection with the outside world. Though you will be intensely focused in your efforts, you will not be completely aware of what you are doing and saying. Your eyes are open, your ears can hear, you do not lose contact with any bodily functions. You are simply harnessing psychic energy and making it work for you. You advise, you should then use it definitely not to foretell the future, but for ideas, advice, and to draw help from the spirit world. Most importantly, you should never let all this overpower or overtake you, but use it with a greater purpose in mind. At the college, we were also told that there are three types of contacts or connections that you can make. You can contact your higher self, other loving entities, or your own spirit guides. How do you know if what you are receiving is really from the source? 
Everything that flows from the other side is always supportive, strong, powerful, mostly direct and to the point. It never tear, tears, down, tears down confidence, but gives you strength to carry on and assures that you can do it. It fills you with a warmth and loving positive energy, gives you hope for the future, and assures you that God loves you and all will be well. Harry Edwards, a great healer and psychic, advises that there is one very important point to remember. You are receiving information from another dimension, and just because someone is in the spirit world, it does not make him God. He is still what he was in life. So listen to what he says, but also use your own intuition and powers of reasoning. Do not blindly follow any commands except those that your own heart dictates. The best way to judge the accuracy of what you have written is to see how much of it comes true. Because of love, many links are made. Some continue on the periphery, just content to talk to their loved ones, while some develop further to begin helping others and continue along the spiritual field. The same goes for those on the other side. They also have their own roles to play. Some continue just to give their loved ones hope and peace of mind, and some guide help the lead, help and lead people onto the spiritual path. And some do not want to be disturbed at all. I am aware that in many cases, Baba's grace, Carl's role of helper, and maybe mine as counselor, does help towards a successful conclusion. But this should not be considered as the ideal solution to everyone, everyone's problems. I have to keep in mind that very often things do not work out that easily, and problems can arise because of karmic debts, or when there are lessons to be learned, and sometimes there are no real conclusions in sight. There have been many ups and downs, and many more lessons to learn. But in the process of this journey, with every successful trip to Mehrabad and with every day that passes, I have come still closer and closer to Baba. In the beginning, if you had told me that Carl's messages to me would stop, I would have been devastated, but not anymore. Sure, I will miss speaking to Carl, for he is my son, but it will not be the end of the world, because now I know that everything is Baba's. When Baba is there, there is no beginning and no ending, there is only forever. This is about auto writing. Now I want to leave this open for you all to ask questions. Um, I just want to know about Mayrabad. Do we want to go and stay there for some yeah. days? Do you have to book it all in advance and contact? Me? Yes, you have to book in advance because uh, it's uh, on certain days it's very full and other days it's not full. But you have to book in advance because it's safer. You go all the way there and you may not get placed, so it's better to say, take the number from me, I have the number. I talked about auto writing. Uh, when you discovered auto writing and you found out that it allowed you to reach out to your loved ones, did you also look for other methods which actually tell you and show you about your uh, loved ones? Very ignorant. So I took it, I, I took a long time, a very long time to, I mean I was writing but I was not believing everything that I was writing because I was very skeptical. And you know, everyone around me was so skeptical, no, this is all rubbish, this is like this, this is like this. So until proofs came, you know, and proofs will come. And until your writing is proved, you have, because it's, it's a very thin line between your mind and mind of spirit. And that too, it's like in the college we were told that it's like sun and the moon coming together. It's very seldom that there's, a, there's an eclipse. So total thing is always 50, 6, you know, 50, 50, 50, 40, 60. Your mind always tells you, it comes in the way somewhere. So auto writing is like that. You have to take it that way. You can't have a 100% answer. Not too sure if I'm wording this correctly, but it seems like when you get advice from guides that it's um, maybe uh, intangible in a way or maybe indirect. Um, like it's a guide, but it's maybe like you're saying not an answer. So can you talk to that a little bit? Hey, I couldn't understand what you were saying. Like intuition. Like intuition. No, even if, even if you do the auto writing or something, some of the, what you get back may not be direct answers. And 
and maybe some intangible, be intangible in a sense. Um, I'm not sure I'm saying this correctly. I can answer that. Uh, it, yeah, it, it, it depends actually from answer to answer and question to question. It's, there's no such rule that you'll get only an intangible answer or it will be only philosophical. Some of the answers are grounded and very uh, clear directions. But uh, but maybe uh, like if you have to say, if the question that you asked was about making a choice, then uh, the answer will be a guideline. It may not be so black and white as uh, between A and B do A. You know, because the, the choice is always a free will choice of the soul, of the, of the individual. So one has to exercise that. And uh, sometimes the, uh, the question, depending on the question you ask, the answer may be uh, one that is intangible. And uh, sometimes the, if the question is, is more rooted or more about immediate life or, or you know, uh, you know, what, what should I do, then it may be a little more, uh, you know, earthbound or more uh, practical in nature. I don't know if that helps or answers your question. 